Dr. Burju Yakuchakar would give her presentation to us on the subject of social uh, work in Turkey. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, first, I would just be brief in thanking the organizers for this, um, for inviting me and for organizing this workshop. And I would also would like to express my uh, uh, grief in terms of, of uh, what happened and you know the the days that we are experiencing in our country's context um, today um, as the last presenter of a long day uh, I will try to briefly shed some light on uh, the contemporary transformation taking place in the social welfare domain in the context of Turkish Turkish uh, uh, Republic uh, where I would like to uh, highlight a couple of issues, emerging issues, issues in the domain of social work, uh, where we experience uh, um, the transformation that brings about the rise of the market, which was very much blended with the familialistic and, you know, in some sense, conservatist uh, um, manners and attitudes. Um, so I will start the presentation by briefly describing the welfare regime in the Turkish context by highlighting the challenges as well as policy responses. Then I would just briefly describe the social work domain, the contemporary social work uh, in the Turkish context. Uh, then I would briefly uh, go into a couple of policy developments where I can just um, shortly um, present uh, as cases where I can support my argument in terms of marketization as well as familialistic uh, uh, motivations. And then I would try to wrap up with um, leaving some kind of statements in terms of, of the issues and challenges that this context is bringing about. And I would be very happy to discuss with further questions and comments, you know, um, if you have energy uh, uh, at the end of the session, of course. Um, so um, I start by describing the welfare regime because even though we are talking about the privatization in a, in a you know, broader context throughout this workshop, um, I find it very important and very uh, um, um, consistent to talk about what type of a welfare regime we are talking about because welfare regime uh, is something that's beyond the welfare state itself. So in the morning we talked about uh, uh, the extent of the welfare state and welfare state expenditures. But um, when we try to discuss the emerging trends uh, um, which are matched with the policy challenges, of course we need to think beyond uh, uh, um, the state and non-state type of dimensions where I would like to highlight that when we talk about a welfare regime we are simplistically talking about uh, 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 the modes in which welfare is produced and, and provided uh, in a given society. Uh, so, um, and in, in, in that kind of a welfare regime structure, we are mainly highlighting uh, uh, three broad cores, which are the, the state or the government, uh, uh, and the market as the second one, and the informal domain, which also includes households, fami families, and communities, and so on and so forth. Uh, so, looking from this direction, of course, what we see in the Turkish context is a kind of an, uh, uh, what we call inegalitarian corporatist structure. So, uh, it's inegalitarian in the sense that um, there is certain sets of internal polarization as well as uh, uh, serious gaps in pr protection. And also corporatist in the sense that, you know, it inherits very much uh, 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 from the uh, development of the welfare, welfare structures, especially in the aftermath of the Second World War, emerging through the social security systems first and then uh, uh, the other um, welfare provision coming afterwards. Uh, so um, 
so as I said, um, uh, this in inegalitarian corporate structure uh, shares some similarities, of course, with the Southern European welfare regimes. And you know, uh, um, for the last couple of decades or so, we see certain set of, of comparative articles, especially with the contribution of Professor John Gall from Hebrew University of Israel, uh, who also includes Israel into this Mediterranean or Southern European type of welfare regime classification. Uh, so that's, that's what I find very uh, uh, significantly important in um, contextualizing the current challenges and transformations we are experiencing in the Turkish context. And that would be helpful for us to also to discuss the Israeli case, even if we don't have a kind of a corresponding presentation uh, in this session or tomorrow. Anyway. Um, so, um, so these similarities are uh, uh, very much laden with the structures of employment, uh, the prevalence of informality, dual labor markets, characteristics of so former social security, which brings about uh, um, um, different types of, of structures related to different occupational groups, and also the very uh, uh, strong um, uh, existence of insiders and outsiders dilemma, uh, um, which highlights the prevalence of informality in the labor market. And just as Professor Pala mentioned, it also leads to certain sets of gaps in coverage in terms of the health care uh, and in terms of health insurance too. Uh, and, you know, in such a formal framework, what we see is that family, community, and all sorts of other informal networks like kinship and, and neighborhood and so on and so forth, uh, uh, emerge as a very strong proxy for the welfare institutions or the general provision of welfare. Uh, so um, if we define the, the social safety net as a whole, including all these providers of welfare, then in the Turkish context, we see a very strongly patchy structure. And uh, this patchy structure, if I'm, if I'm to unfold, um, in relation to different types of, of domains. Uh, for instance, when we look at the social security, uh, we see that formal mechanisms of social security systems are very much prevalent. And these are, you know, uh, uh, of course, the recent reforms, which I will touch upon, have, have changed the way it's structured, of course. But uh, it's, it's mainly state-led or stately, uh, uh, um, state-organized type of regime. And looking at the healthcare, just as Professor Pala reviewed with the health transformation program, we see a clear dual existence of the state and market provision together. And looking at the social services, um, we see the, the coexistence of, of state provision and market steps in and family remains there as one of the core uh, uh, providers of welfare. And looking at the social assistance mechanisms, especially thinking about uh, the prevalence of poverty and those sets of, of policy responses that are addressing the inequality, income inequality, and, and also the uh, um, before and after type, before and after transfers type of poverty rates, uh, we see that the, the provision of, of certain schemes by the state is there, but they are not sufficient to lift individuals out of this, this poverty, and also families there to provide uh, um, any kinds of, of cash and in-kind type of resources. Um, so, um, having said so, I would just like to go over a couple of challenges that are facing the regime for, you know, um, starting from the neoliberal transformation, which have been accelerated, especially in the aftermath of 2001. Uh, um, so what we observe is a very serious transformation in the labor market, which was supported by deruralization. So we are talking about an economy which has been transforming from being an agrarian one towards an uh, uh, towards a, a one that has that tried to industrialize but now became a kind of a service based type of an economy and we see the emergence of rapid urbanization and relatedly emerging patterns of new poverty and also as we have discussed in the morning declining employment rates in particular and, and of course labor force participation rates related to the general economic context 
uh, uh, not only uh, um, not only seriously affecting the male participation, but also uh, we discuss the gender dimension of that. I will not go into detail of this, but we tend to uh, uh, we tend to see prevalence of high rates of unemployment for especially young sections of the society. And also another important uh, challenge, which is still a very consistent challenge as well, the waves of migration. Of course, the, the social transformations taking place is very much related to uh, both internal and external waves of migration. Internal waves related to the armed conflicts in the east and southeastern regions uh, and, and forced migrations in, in several waves starting from mid-1990s and apparently existing also today. Uh, and also the, the, the external waves of migration, uh, uh, Turkey emerging as a kind of a crossroad for, for many um, uh, migrants, for, uh, many transit migrants, as well as uh, um, the Syrian refugees, which have been influxingly uh, um, coming to the Turkey. So, um, so the, the, the current context, the policy, the welfare regime in general, has been seriously challenged by these sets of, of developments. And of course, um, what we see is that certain sets of policy responses are emerging. Uh, uh, to meet or towards these challenges. But we can summarize what we see in the Turkish context as a kind of an uh, existence of a paradigm shift, which do have a kind of an, uh, a neoliberal flavor, of course, and also it has a very conservative flavor as well, especially with the reign of the AKP government since 2002. Uh, so uh, in the realm of social policies, um, the emerging paradigm shift is very much translated into, you know, strengthening the family type of argument. So keeping the family as the core of the welfare provision, while also bringing about or articulating several market-oriented measures, which I will exemplify in a minute. Uh, so some others are calling this, this trend as liberal residualism flavored with, with social conservative values. Residualism in the sense that this, the, the, the welfare state provisions remains highly residual in terms of, of providing a consistent safety net, but also um, this residualism is coupled with market-oriented measures uh, which are very much supported by the social conservative values, highlighting the role of family, the role of, 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 of especially in terms of care, uh, uh, highlighting the, the, the role of, of um, 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 patriarchal type of, of um, uh, division of labor within the household. Of course, what we, when we say neoliberal, neoliberal paradigm shift, we are not referring to a kind of a very simplistic retreat of the state, uh, uh, but what we observe is a kind of a new welfare governance, which is emerging between, which is emerging as a kind of a partnership or as a kind of a collaboration between the state, families, uh, uh, um, uh, all kin networks, NGOs, sometimes charities, and also local governments and municipalities. Um, so, um, so this takes me, before I move on to the, the policy examples, um, as today I'm, I'm, I've planned to talk about the social work domain, where we see the emergence of, as I've described at the beginning, we see the emergence of three types of actors, uh, uh, where we can easily see the, uh, um, the the type of, of um, paradigm shifts uh, uh, also involving market values and, and conservatism. Uh, so uh, I would just like to briefly introduce um, the social work in the Turkish context. The social work services, the, the social services carried out by the state are very much organized under the Ministry of Family and Social Policies. So the, this ministry is a very recent ministry because it was established before the elections of 2011. Before that, we didn't have that kind of an, uh, a ministry, but several types of, of uh, director generals um, 
uh, organized uh, uh, across ministries, uh, across different state ministries. Um, but um, all of a sudden, you know, you know, not all of a sudden, but all of a sudden in quotation, uh, um, the, the AKP government have unified all these DGs under a single ministry, which was named as Fa Ministry of Family and Social Policies, underlining their policy discourses, of course. Um, so the, the relevant DGs that are providing social services in the Turkish context first relates to children's services, um, that cater for uh, uh, any types of, of, of foster care, institutional care, and, and, and else. And then we see disabled and elderly services. Um, um, then there is the DG of women's status. Um, and there is the DG of family and community services, which relates to any types of, of uh, training and, and provision of, of educational services. So they are not particularly doing community service. They don't have any community centers at all. They've closed everything. So this is an also uh, a very nice uh, contradictory type of an uh, um, a DG that is not doing what it's supposed to do. And also there is the social assistance DG, which is very much involved with prov provision of cash and in-kind transfers to those uh, uh, who deem to be uh, uh, poor from state's point of view. Uh, so these DGs are organized at the local level as well as provincial directorates. Uh, only with the exception of social assistance, they are the provincial directorates, but only the social assistance DG do have some kind of an autonomous and, and uh, um, um, some kind of an state type of an NGO which is organized in the form of associations at the local level, which I'm not going into now. Um, so um, in this structure, I would just like to exemplify a couple of policy developments across different groups of society uh, that these so social services are targeting. Um, looking at what, what the policy developments concerning children are, uh, we see that there is a kind of an um, legislative development that brings about the child protection legislation by 2005. So this legislation is setting out all the sets of procedures concerning the protection of children, protection of children in need, and also protection of children uh, uh, who are in conflict with law. Um, so victims of, 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 of abuse as well as those committing crime. Uh, so this legislation is also coexisting with all types of services directed to the children, including uh, uh, institutional care, foster care, adoption, and so on and so forth. Uh, but um, even if there is the, the grant legislations there, which is setting out very much details about procedures, there are several outstanding issues concerning the state of children in the Turkish context in the last decade. First and foremost, when we look at the, the issues of violence and abuse, uh, we see that um, um, the, the emergence of or the um, institutional restructuring and legislative framework brought about almost no progress in terms of uh, preventing or eliminating the violence and abuse facing the children. Uh, um, some of this is related to the limited monitoring of the available measures that are set out in the legislation. And also thinking about the institutional restructuring that, that turned that, that <coughs> DG into a kind of an DG under the ministry brought about uh, a certain set of bureaucratic uh, uh, problems. And also looking at the juvenile justice, um, uh, we see that the emergence of child protection legislation uh, ended up in patchy implementation, especially in relation to the children who, uh, uh, who get in conflict with, with the law. Uh, uh, we see that the implementation of this legislation partly uh, uh, did not solve the problems uh, related to the, the, uh, um, the justice system in general because the justice system is not indeed targeting the children. And this is an important, this has been a very important issue, especially concerning the ethnic dimension of the problem because, you know, thinking, you know, going back to the um, 
the, the, the conflict periods, uh, we see that m many of the, uh, uh, of the Kurdish children have been facing serious problems in terms of, of the justice system, which really puts them into, uh, 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 which, th which, do not, um, which do not target them as children uh, and do not put them into juvenile justice system, which is patch patchily existing, but more, more of a, um, a criminal problem, and then uh, they are facing problems within the justice system as well. And also in terms of provision of the good quality services, like um, good, good quality services uh, related to detention and so on and so forth, there is very slow progress. And thinking about the, the, um, the motivations towards deinstitutionalization, especially uh, leaving the, the policies of, of institutional care towards foster care and adoption, um, the, the policy emphasis is very strongly on deinstitutionalization, sometimes underlined with the cost containment measures, you know, highlighting the, the high costs facing the institutional care. But also it finds some way uh, um, in the uh, discursive way where the, um, the foster care or, or adoption type of measures have been very much highlighted with the uh, rise of, of the charity and private benevolence. For instance, we see the emergence of, of certain state motivated type of civil initiatives uh, um, just as the one that I've exemplified. Um, so the state is very much uh, uh, advertising and, and motivating the, the individuals towards private type of, of benevolence. Um, is, is, um, while it was emphasizing the civic engagement dimension, it is very much channeling resources towards those individuals who would like to adopt children uh, or who would like to undertake some kind of child some children for foster care. So state is directly paying for it. So cost containment arguments are nonsense, but the state is now shifting the role towards, uh, while deinstitutionalizing, the state is shifting the role towards the family and you know the civil society in general and towards the, the private benevolence. Of, of the members of the society. Um, um, the looking at the disabled, uh, uh, looking at the policy developments in, in disability, um, in, in the morning, Yelda have, have shown us that the social expenditures have been on the rise. And this um, rise is very much related to introduction of certain cash, transfers, me cash transfer mechanisms, which are related to the recent developments in terms of, of disability legislation. Uh, so in the AKP period, uh, we see the uh, um, ratification of the legislation on for, for, uh, uh, for people with disabilities, which is a very broad legislation that deals with issues concerning the health, education, employment, care services types of issues that disabled individuals are facing, but also uh, uh, it brings about very significant uh, discursive uh, uh, measures. Uh, so um, this legislation is pioneered by the, the, the minister, pioneered by the DG first, by the government first, and then uh, um, run still in, being practiced by the ministry and uh, AKP government, especially in electoral, in, in before the elections, uh, is very much highlighting the, 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 the policy developments that this legislation brought about. And uh, to exemplify my argument, I would like to highlight uh, two or three types of, of measures. Uh, that the legislation aims at. Uh, and these measures are mainly aiming at family coherence. Family coherence is the wording that the legislation itself uses. So it says that this legislation aims at um, targeting the family coherence concerning the disabled individuals because they have the right to live in the environment that they are used to and so on and so forth. So they have that kind of an 
um, um, policy emphasis. And also we see the emergence of marketization, which I will elaborate in a moment. So what it did is it brought about certain set of uh, home-based care allowances. So these are the monthly payments that, are, uh, that have been provided to the female caregiver uh, at the household. Uh, so um, as Yerda has also highlighted, the, the increases in the female employment in the health and, and social services domain is very much related to these allowances that it's structured uh, that these payments um, are paid in return for the provision of, of, of care services by the female caregiver within the household. So it, it should be the mother or sister or, 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 or wife, whoever, but it should be the female member. And it's the amount um, that is exactly corresponding to the minimum, the official minimum wage. Uh, so it, it's a kind of an disincentive for the female members of the household to go outside and look for work. And they cannot delegate um, this responsibility if they, uh, if they would like to receive that home-based care allowance. Um, so the second dimension is related to the accessibility issues. So the accessibility, the legislation um, foresees very extensive measures in terms of providing accessibility of disabled individuals. Uh, and maintaining their participation to social life. I use it in quotation because this is still problematic. Um, so um, the commitments that have to be made by the state um, institutions have not still been uh, uh, met. And also as one significant dimensions of marketization, we see that the state brought about generous subsidy schemes for private rehabilitation centers. So it's a way of outsourcing the, the rehabilitation services. So state is paying per disabled to the reha private rehabilitation centers uh, per inpatient or um, um, so that Lots and lots of private rehabilitation centers have been opened up. So they have been, you know, chasing around, hunting for disabled individuals to register just because this is a very guaranteed scheme of, of, uh, um, of income maintenance in that sense. So it's a, you know, interesting way of, of describing how state interacts with, with the private sector. So it's not direct outsourcing, but it's a way of, of providing a kind of an uh, uh, incentives for the private sector to emerge. What it does, you know, in terms of a regulation, of course, the state sets out a kind of a basic list of, of what, has, what these institutions should look like and what types of employees do, ha do they have to employ. And, you know, thinking about the, uh, uh, the obligation to hire a social worker, what they do is they, you know, just like the, um, the pharmacy, uh, just like in the Turkish context, we have pharmacists who hire out, you know, who um, hire out their their diplomas, you know, for 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 a pharmacy to be opened up. Uh, uh, that official degrees are, are needed, but the people who run the pharmacies in practice are not that pharmacists in in many instances. And what is occurring in the social worker context in this private rehabilitation centers is that they do have, they do. You know, on paper they have social workers, but these social workers are, are very much hiring out, uh, 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 renting out their, their diplomas, so that they just drop in one day of a week, they just, you know, sign out the papers that they have to do and so on and so forth. So this is a very interesting trend. So I'm very running to, out of time, but I would like to highlight two more domains. One is related to women as victims of domestic violence. So looking at... Um, um, Looking at the gender equality adventure of the Turkish government, we see that there are very significant improvements in the last two decades, especially on paper, looking at the legislative changes that, uh, uh, that came about 
um, in aligning with SIDA uh, requirements, uh, amendments to the Constitution uh, concerning sexual assaults in the, and changes in the penal code and also changes in the civil code. Uh, these are very significant improvements on paper. Um, and also the enactment of the new legislation for the protection from violence. We see that this government have adopted in 2012 uh, a law to protect family, which is named as law to protect family and prevent violence against against women. So um, what this legislation brings about is a kind of a wider institutionalization. So for instance, the police officers, the gendarmerie, and so on and so forth are very strictly defined roles in that legislative system. And they have very uh, uh, strictly defined uh, um, uh, authorities, um, but apparently, as the name says, it aims at protecting the family. So whenever there is a kind of an uh, conflict with two partners, conflict with two partners, which becomes, you know, when women goes to the police officer and says that, you know, uh, uh, I'm, I'm seriously experiencing violence from my partner, in many of the instances, police officers are acting like matchmakers. They are saying that, oh, look, this is your husband. This is your partner and you know um, these are the you know these are small things that happen in family life so you have to you have to go back and you know and and we see the emergence of of um, um, women uh, women murders um, so women who are asking for protection so this legislation is obliging the uh, uh, um, the security forces to provide uh, protection whenever women asks for it. Whenever women says that, look, I don't feel secure and I'm, you know, prone to death, so I'm I'm demanding some kind of protection. But this, even if this legislation is setting out the rules and authorities for the for the security forces, most of the women are not provided that security, or this security fails to protect them, you know, at the time that they need most. So we see the emergence of, of, of female deaths uh, uh, by their partners recently. And looking at you know, the institutional structure, we have the women, we have the shelters that are serving for, for women as, as victims of domestic violence, but these shelters are providing a very limited duration of service, only six months, and you cannot, in most of the cases, because of the capacity constraints, you cannot go there with your children, so, so the women, especially women, Children are very much separated from their children. They are institutionalized at shelters, and children are sent to uh, um, children's homes and so on and so forth. There is the scarcity of places, and also patriarchal mentality, just a, a, as I have exemplified in the response of the security forces towards these kind of instances. Patriarchal mentality is everywhere, and it's constraining the way that this protection of the family is underlined. And we see the hate crimes and also murders victimizing the LGBT individuals. So the, as the legislation is the prevention of violence against women and concerning the hate crimes and murders that the LGBT individuals are facing, um, this becomes an issue of, of uh, family oriented, oriented or conservative type of values shaping the way that policies are practiced. And last but not the least, I will just talk about the elderly. And we have the uh, institutional structure of nursing homes. Uh, so nursing homes provide services. Uh, state does own certain sets of nursing homes. And also there are non-state actors providing services for elderly, uh, including NGOs, private sectors, as well as municipalities. And also state provides uh, certain cash allowances, especially for those elderly above the age of 65, and they lack social security. And whenever they undergo that means testing, they have to provide that. They have no kinds of relatives to provide you know, that kind of a support. So uh, in the domain of elderly, we see that there's a very strong family-oriented approach. And, uh, and each and every public statement that is made by the by the officials, the prime minister, or the, the minister in charge of family and social policies, we see that they keep underlying you know, the, the strong role that the Turkish family is assuming towards the elderly. So they always talk about the myth of, of large families 
you know, intergenerational families. And, and I remember uh, uh, President Erdogan when he was a, when he was prime minister in mid in mid two thousands. Um, I remember him giving the examples of, you know, I'm very proud with my society because our elderly are not dying alone. And, you know, they look at the, look at the, you know, European societies and all elderly are dying alone. They don't have any relatives and nobody do care about their elderly. But I'm proud of my nation type of expressions that always highlight the role that always highlight the role of the family. Just wrapping up um, with the issues, I'm done, I know. But I have a couple of wrapping up type of words. Uh, so um, we see the existence um, um, of more than state type of institutions and actors. Um, we see a significant transformation of the administrative structure that brings about marketization trends and also that fosters familialization of the services or that you know strengthens those. Um, even though there are legislative changes, these legislative changes are far from bringing about uh, um, um, well-being creating type of, of uh, outcomes. And also there are serious institutional capacity problems, especially concerning uh, um, the institutional structures for women, uh, uh, for women's shelters, and also the protection, care, and rehabilitation centers targeting young girls who are victims of, of abuse. Uh, uh, so there are very, very significant problems. And also the, the, the quality as well as quantity of the professionals in that domain are very critical. And, and it takes us to discuss the role of, of the social work education and training of professionals in that domain that would help you know, uh, uh, structuring, restructuring the, the schemes. So I'm very uh, thankful for your patience. And I'm very sorry for running out my time. Um, thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to discuss more. <laughs> thank you.